Welcome, everyone, to our Cumberland campus on this sort of sort of drizzly, blustery day. But uh, we won't let that dampen our spirits as we're as we're all uh, glad to get together. And I tell you, one day I will be happy to look around the room and not see masks. And so uh, I'm, I'm hoping one day that that mine will turn into a pollen mask in the spring. So uh, anyway. Uh, I'm proud to welcome to the college Dr. William H. Turner. Dr. Turner spent his professional career studying and working on behalf of marginalized communities, helping them to create opportunities, yet not abandon their important cultural ties. He has done this important work, his life's work, in multiple ways, a teacher, a writer, college professor, and administrator. Dr. Turner has not only worn many different hats in a career that has won national and regional praise, but he probably does not have the space to hang all the special awards bestowed upon him throughout the years. I'd like to mention just a few. He's been inducted into the Kentucky Civil Rights Hall of Fame, uh, recognized as the Reverend Martin Luther King Citizen of the Year, awarded an honorary doctorate at the University of North Carolina and inducted into the College of Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame at the University of Kentucky. And now we're here today to recognize his latest accomplishment, the publication of Harlan Renaissance, a critically acclaimed memoir that chronicles his life growing up in Lynch. He writes these stories and tales merge as a community cultural identity narrative blended well enough to, I hope, paint the picture of the unique yet universal souls of black Appalachian coal town folks. We're also here to welcome Dr. Turner back to home to Southeast, where he began as a student before later transferring on to the University of Kentucky. Dr. Turner, along with Southeast President Emeritus Bruce Ayers, was in the college's first ever writing fiction class taught by Professor Lee Pennington, who is a notable writer in his own right. And it was from that class that a compilation of poetry and short fiction, Spirit Hollow, was released, containing what probably was the first thing Dr. Turner had ever published, a short story titled, Hell is Just Like Heaven. Dr. Turner also designed the cover of Spirit Hollow, winning an, over another design that was created by his friend, Dr. Ayers. <laughs> they, Dr. Turner, if you come up, please. I want to, uh, I want to present you with, a, with uh, an original copy wow. of Spirit Hollow <laughs> that uh, that we have had safely stored in our archives here for a number of years, and, and rest assured, we still have a couple more copies left that'll stay there. <laughs> so, so, without further ado, welcome, and let's all welcome uh, Dr. Turner. Anybody speak French in here? Bonjour. Anybody speak Spanish in here? How do you say, how do you say good morning in Spanish? <laughs> Buenos dias. Buenos dias. You know, I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, uh, went there, I retired to go there to be near my grandchildren. And uh, uh, we pay for them to take Spanish lessons. Uh, every week we pay for them to pay, take Spanish lessons because I tell my grandchildren, you cannot grow up and be successful in Texas if you don't speak Spanish. In fact, you cannot, in a few years, grow up anywhere in America and be successful and not speak Spanish. I'm telling you, anybody in this room named Lupita, Jose, Manuel? See there? One thing you'll find about Spanish-speaking people in the United States right now, if you want to know where the jobs are, follow the Spanish people. Follow the people from Mexico. Now, y'all can fold all up, because I said that if you want to, but it doesn't make any difference. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
for being here this morning. What else was I going to say? Uh, well, I'm just kind of overwhelmed, but I'll, I'll settle down here in a second. I've come to discuss with you some parts of this book I was blessed to be able to write, and it's called The Harlan Renaissance, and it, it, it looks at these three places right here, a place I call West Vatucky. <laughs> it's where West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky and Southwest Virginia kind of come together. And uh, in those spaces for about 150 years, a lot and lots of black people lived in those spaces. My great-grandparents were born in Lee County, Virginia, Pennington Gap. Uh, my father was born in Wise County, Virginia, in Coburn, Virginia. Uh, my mother was born in Machine Shop Holler next to Smoky Row in Benham, Kentucky. Uh, so uh, the roots are very deep. Those are the four of the last black coal miners in Harlan County, Patsy Tinsley. Who is that, Ricky Holt? Ricky Holt. Ricky Holt. Uh, Ronnie Massey, right? Yeah, and uh, oh, Drina. <laughs> uh, I want to dedicate my remarks to this lady whose photograph is shown there named Dr. Carolyn Mitchell Sunday. Everybody that knows Carolyn, hold up your hand. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn Mitchell. So I want to dedicate what I say. That photograph at the bottom, I took that picture about 10 years ago. On October the 14th, uh, I was home. And I was going down what we call Y Street, in, in, but it's really First Street. So without, with the power vested in me by particular, no one in particular, I'm going to rename First Street Carolyn Sunday Street. <laughs> so Miss Massey, what did you do? Adrena, you tell them Bill just renamed Y Street after Carolyn this morning. Thank you, uh, Vic Adams. Uh, I'm glad to be home. Someone wrote a book. I think it was Thomas Wolfe wrote a book that title of which is, You Can't Return Home. Well, I come home all the time. Uh, I left home in, uh, when I finished the Southeast Community College on uh, May the 9th, 1966. I'm 76 years old this year, and uh, I've been home back and forth uh, 448 times in the last 55 years. So I come back home. I was home last month. Uh, so no matter how far my feet have roamed, uh, there's still no place like Harlan County to me. I want to thank this guy right here. Would you please stand up, sir? Yay! <laughs> uh, Bruce and I, and Barbara, love you too. Barbara is Bruce's wife. Uh, if it wasn't for her, he wouldn't be nothing. Uh, Bruce and I met here at the Southeast Center roughly 60 years ago, right? 1964. Uh, and we were students here together, and we went to UK together after that. And Bruce was a president here for 27 or so years. And Bruce has this book, y'all, that he wrote under his nom de plume, uh, Will Be Heirs. He was scared to put his real name on it. <laughs> so uh, it's called uh, Foreign Blood. And I, I commend that book to you to buy uh, fiction. Uh, Bruce is a longtime friend of mine and a confidant. And when we were younger, uh, in the 60s, he used to encourage me to stand up and fight for my rights. And uh, uh, so when I left and went to the University of Kentucky, for example, in 1966, in Lexington, one of the first things I did while I was there is I started to pick at every home game of Adolph Rupp. I would walk around by myself with a sign every night in the rain, in the snow. We would take tomatoes up against the head and eggs, and they would call us all kind of dirty names, uh, but we did it for two and a half, three years because Adolph Rupp looked me in my face one day and said, I don't want none of them to play basketball for me. Uh, you know what he meant by none of them, right? <laughs> and, and now they got more black basketball players over there than they got, <laughs> Van Camp's got poking beans, as he used to say. <laughs> so anyway, uh, thanks, Bruce, for encouraging me to get involved like that. Uh, and Bruce also encouraged me to write. Uh, I want you to go over to Mount one of these days. You're going to visit this unique place in Pennington Gap called the Appalachian African American Cultural Center. They do some really fantastic things because if a people lose track of their history, they might as well just lose track of everything. And they do wonderful things there. There's another place that's going to be a museum focused on black experience in Harlan County. That's where I went to school. The Lynch Colored Public School should be turned into a museum. Uh, is there anyone here who thinks that should not happen? Let them speak now or forever hold their peace. Okay, so, so done deal. 
Uh, I want to thank Natalie Gibson. Dr. Gibson is a friend of mine at the system office. Bruce, you know uh, 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 Valerie, Natalie, rather. Uh, and uh, she is the one who has put me in touch with every one of the community colleges of the Kentucky Technical and Community College System. I'm going to visit those campuses just like I'm doing here this morning because uh, that is where I studied. And I want to be able to tell any young people who are going to college that uh, don't let anybody convince you that you can't do it uh, as a mountain person or whatever to, you know, uh, do like I try to do. And that is, if you remember, I don't know if you've ever seen those black and yellow bumblebees that are kind of fat and they got these little short wings. And one day some aeronautical engineers were looking at a little bumblebee like that and they said, this thing can't fly because of the disproportionate size of its wings to its body weight. And the bumblebee just took off and flew. So don't ever believe everything you read. Because if you, read, if you believe everything they wrote about us folks from the mountains, wouldn't none of us be worth a, a hill of beans. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about race here this morning. So those of you who do not like to talk about race, R-A-C-E, as in ethnicity, as in American race issues, you may wish to excuse yourself now. And don't think I'm using the word white or black as some kind of adjective or a verb. It's just the deal. It, it, what it is, what it is. Uh, some of y'all might know this guy. Do you know this guy right here, Ms. Massey? Yes. I don't know if any of y'all remember John Holt. John Holt worked with the Parrots around here for many, many the, are the Parrots still in Harlan County? Shelby them? <laughs> yeah. John was, I see, I talk to John all the time. He's one of the smartest men I ever met in my life. Uh, and, and so he has taught me a lot about how important it is to keep these traditions alive. So I wrote this book. Uh, this book I wrote, there's a cover of it there. Here's one right up here. And I want to tell you very quickly why I wrote this book. One reason why I wrote this book is that there's this old saying that says, throughout the history of the world, people are always saying, by the way, whatever happened to the so-and-so people down there in Black Star? Is Black Star still in Harlan County? Uh, whatever happened to those people in Wallens Creek? Is Wallens Creek still in Harlan County? And RJ, I met somebody this morning say he was from RJ, A-R-J-A-Y, where is that? Uh, uh, Bruce, you're from Llewellyn or somebody? Right, so whatever happened to those people? And if people don't write down their history, that's what will happen to them. They'll, you'll never know what happened to them. So uh, we have this wonderful history, and if we can't tell people about what we did, uh, that's what will happen. Another thing, too, about uh, why I think I wrote this book is that uh, I grew up in this town here in Lynch where there's an extraordinarily high number of very, very smart people. Some of the most intelligent people I ever met in my life came from Lynch, Kentucky. Some of the most of those people were black like me. And one of the things about being black like me I found in the long run of my life is that if you get a superior education, it will minimize the discrimination against you. You'll be surprised what happens when the, uh, uh, the other day, for example, I had missed a flight in Charlotte. And I'm banging on his window, looking at the jetway, and a lady stepped out of that door that the FAA says, you don't open, once you open that, once you close that door, you can't open that. She stepped out there and said, are you Dr. Turner? I said, yes. Because <laughs> I had missed my flight. And she said, we were waiting for you. Now, you know, my mama used to say, you ain't no real doctor. <laughs> But it helps. You'll be surprised what little things mean to people if they see certain titles behind your name. You can be dressed any kind of way. But if people know you have a superior education, any of you young people, remember, get a superior education. A superior education. And you'll be surprised what great things will happen. OK, I wrote this book about this experience in these cold towns because about 1979 or so, I met this man named Alex Haley. Uh, Mr. Haley had written a book, as you might recall, called Roots, which became a television miniseries that was the widest distributed, most seen show since. And uh, uh, Mr. Haley at the time was on the board of trustees at Berea College. And he called me and he says, I heard you do something about black people in the mountains of the South. I want to meet you. And so I got to know Mr. Haley. I worked for him for a while as a research assistant to him. 
Uh, this is me when I was, uh, I, had, I had black hair then, as you see, <laughs> a long time ago. There's undeniable evidence that Harlan County produced untold numbers of black people of superior talent. One of them is sitting back here now, Rutland. Where's Rutland? Is Rutland in here? Hey, Rutland's one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life. I'm telling you. Uh, 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 I bet every one of y'all in here remember this lady here. This photograph was taken in 1950, so that was how many years ago? That was about 70 years ago. Uh, Miss Constance Ellison. That picture of Miss Ellison with the red arrow, uh, that's her, Frankie Calloway's mama, and a couple other ladies with the Benham Colored School PTA, 1950. Uh, the Rosenwald School on the right there, the Lynch Colored School, the Benham School. So why do people study history? Why is it so important? Why do we teach it from the primary grades to graduate school? And why do even politicians? I was listening to Joe Manchin this morning making historical references to why he is not backing uh, the Biden plan. People always refer to history. History is so important. Uh, here's a historian named Carter G. Woodson. Uh, this man founded what we call Black History Month. He went to Berea College in 1898. He graduated from Berea in 1903. He was the first African American to receive a PhD from Harvard. Uh, and in fact, when he received his PhD from Harvard, the first thing he did was went back to West Virginia where he had grown up. His father had been a coal miner. That fellow there, Ed Cabell, dedicated his life to collecting and archiving and sharing the histories of black people in Appalachia. That's what Andrea Massey does. Andrea is the historian for the East Kentucky Social Club. You have to keep up with your history. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, that's my father. My father was born in 1917 in Coburn. And this is me right here and my five brothers and sisters, or I'm sorry, four who were older than me. Uh, uh, I don't know if they still have the expression called stair step children. We were stair step children. I once asked my father, how could mama possibly have five children in seven and a half years? Now, the Brown family was that way too. It was about 15 of y'all, wasn't it? <laughs> we used to call them the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> Ten brothers on the team and five sisters and cheerleaders. When I asked my daddy, I said, Daddy, how mama had these five of us in seven and a half? Peggy was seven and a half years young, older than me. And Daddy said, well, boy, here's what happened. The train would come up to holler at 5.30 every morning, making all that noise. And it was too early to get up. <laughs> and too late to go back to sleep. I said, shame on you, Dad. But there were lots of families like ours, eight and 10 children. Black families, white families, you can name it. Everybody had lots of children. And in fact, after I was born, Mama had three more sons, Tony and Carl and Jeff. And then she adopted the children of Miss, Miss Pauline Reynolds, Betty and Ben Reynolds and them. They stayed, so Mama took care of 10 of us. In fact, I've been reading a lot in my life about whether or not same sex, I'm sorry, opposite sex siblings should sleep in the same room. Does anybody in here ever slept in the same room with their sister when they were little? Look at everybody like, well, I don't really want to say. <laughs> but you know, uh, when I was born in 1946 and Peggy had been born in 1938, we slept in the same room, me and Peggy and Evelyn and Irving. Yeah, in the same room, which wasn't much bigger than this table over here until Peggy graduated from high school. And when you grow up in a house where all your brothers and sisters are in the same room with you, you might end up like me and my brothers and sisters. You get inseparable. Uh, I don't know what Dr. Field would say about that, but it didn't hurt us at all. <laughs> uh, on this week that Daddy uh, worked for, this was the week of December 31st, 1946. I was six months old. Daddy bought home $47.50 after two weeks' work. I spent $47.50 for lunch in the... Dallas Airport yesterday. Do you know they sell $22 pita bread in Dallas Airport? I'm just telling you. Can you imagine you have six children and you bring home $50? Uh, you know, I won't say, but I think I paid Rutland that much for a bottle of Woodford Reserve the other night. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Where is Appalachia? I don't think a lot of people know where Appalachia is. The white part there is called Appalachia. It's 14 states that stretch all the way from the southern tier of New York State 
all the way to northwest Mississippi. 14 states, 404 counties, about 27 million people, 3.1 million of whom are African Americans in this place called Appalachia. Uh, Harlan's right there. That's Appalachia. That's Appalachia, a little town over the mountain there. Uh, and that's according to the Appalachian Regional Commission. In fact, uh, one of uh, Appalachia's most favorite sons was named Elvis Presley. You remember Elvis? Elvis was born in Tupelo, Mississippi. Birmingham, Alabama is in the Appalachian region. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is in the Appalachian region. Asheville, beautiful North Carolina is in the Appalachian region. Morgantown, Charleston, Arrington, Poughkeepsie, New York. My daughter-in-law went to, daughter-in-law, my sister-in-law uh, went to college in Poughkeepsie. She went to Vassar. Uh, I've said a little bit about that. That's Kentucky, has about 50 Appalachian counties. That's Harlan County where the red arrow is. So you see more than almost half of the state of Kentucky is considered Appalachia. And in 1964, they, the way they measured Appalachia was by the level of poverty. The number of people who had bad dentistry, the number of running pipes into the creek, all kinds of data that they used to determine what was Appalachia. But there was a time then, a long time ago, nobody wanted to be known as a hillbilly. Nobody wanted to be identified as an Appalachian. Now there's a whole new crop of them. There's a bunch of people who are journalists around the country. They call themselves expatalachians because they live outside the region. Uh, did you know, for example, that three years ago, uh, one of the furthest north counties in Ohio, where Youngstown, Ohio is located, became an Appalachian county? Now that's a pretty big stretch when Appalachia includes Lake Cumberland and Lake Erie. <laughs> but that is the case. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, Appalachia is now somewhere between cornbread and tortillas. <laughs> because the fastest growing population in the Appalachian region are people who come from what we call Hispanic culture, primarily from Mexico. In fact, I'm going to go to Hazard later on today, and one of the most popular restaurants in Hazard used to be called Azio Grande, Big Blue. I don't know who they were trying to appeal to. <laughs> Why would you name a restaurant in Hazard Big Blue? I don't understand that. Uh, but largest, in fact, for example, when I was a boy, my dad used to take me fishing, I think it was on the Holston River in East Tennessee. We would go to Marstown and Rogersville. Anybody know of Marstown? Marstown, Tennessee has the fastest growing population of Mexican Americans in the whole United States. Marstown, Tennessee. In fact, they replaced the black population uh, in terms of the largest minority. I mean, I live in Houston, Texas. 58% of the population in Houston is named Jose. Uh, the state of Texas, that's why Texas spends all this time trying to change the voting laws because the Mexican population is the largest population in Texas. And I don't know if you've been to Los Angeles later. Same way. You live in a very diverse world. Get used to it, young people. Don't think America's going to be a white majority nation when you get my age. It will not. The question is, how are we going to live together? That's the biggest question. How are we going to live together? Because we'll either live together or we'll just die as fools. Quote me. <laughs> All right. Uh, this guy here, Frank Walker, he came up with an idea, and he said, I think I'll start calling black people Afro-Latchians. Uh, Bell Hooks, a famous writer, also uh, considers herself an Appalachian. Frank again. My mother, that's a wonderful picture of my mother. My mother and I were headed to my daddy's funeral that day in 1987, and my mom was born and raised in Harlan County. And I asked her one time, I said, Mama, do you consider yourself, do you identify yourself? I'll ask you all this question. How many of you identify yourself as an Appalachian? You know what my mama said when I asked her if she was an Appalachian? Mom said, now Bill, you know darn well I'm a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> because you know what? A lot, of, a lot of local people rarely ever use the word Appalachian. They say I'm from the mountains, but they rarely say, like a New Yorker says, you know, I'm from Brooklyn, I'm from the Bronx. Uh, so mama says she was a Baptist. <laughs> well, let me tell you what uh, happens sometimes when you consider yourself a hillbilly. Anybody read a book called Hillbilly Elegy? I commend that book to you. 
Uh, some people say that when that book came out in 2016, what J.D. Vance was pointing out is that America has shifted so far to the political right, to the most conservative it had been since the Civil War. That's what he said. And that's how Donald Trump became the President of the United States. And he put it all on the people of the Appalachian region. He said, it's those hillbillies and those yahoos in the mountains. <laughs> you know, the fact of the matter is, that's a bad rap on Appalachia. In fact, Donald Trump was elected President of the United States by highly educated white suburban women in California, in Massachusetts. That's who elected President Trump. America has shifted that much primarily through highly educated people, but they get the rap and put it on, on Jabbo, or whatever his name is. <laughs> Netflix paid uh, Ron Howard, you know, he used to be in that show called The Andy Griffin Show. They paid him $50 million to produce a film called Hillbilly Elegy. I don't know if you saw it, Glenn Close was in it uh, a couple years ago. And they just kind of exploited the stereotypes of Appalachia. Oh, they're all on crack, they're all on Oxycontin, they're all on methamphetamines, they all got Mountain Dew teeth. You've seen the stereotypes. I, 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 when I do my work, I always show the best side I can of where I grew up. I say, what's wrong with that neighborhood right there? That looks idyllic. That looks like something out of a movie. Uh, I got to spend some time with Alex, this man here named John Hope Franklin, one of the most famous historians in all of America. Uh, got to know him very personally. In fact, a couple years ago, my wife and I took our grandchildren on a, a month-long roots tour. We spent time where my wife grew up in Kannapolis, North Carolina, Dale Earnhardt country. Uh, and my wife's mama and daddy worked for a cotton mill, the Cannon Mills. I don't know if you've been to Charlotte lately. You got this huge shopping center called Cannon something. Uh, Concord, North Carolina. Charlotte Motor Speedway. All of that. And we took our children there, uh, our grandchildren. This is our granddaughter here named Africa. Uh, she was at the Appalachian Center across the hill over there. That's the Lynch Colored School Band that my sister was in in 1958. And I want to mention very quickly about this man in this photograph right there. His name is John Stevenson. Uh, Bruce, you remember John. Uh, John was my teacher when I went to the University of Kentucky in 1966. And he was the one who said, you're from Harlan County? I said, yep. Yeah. He said, that's a very interesting place. He was the head of the Appalachian Center of the University of Kentucky. And so John told me, I think you should dedicate your life to studying about black people in the mountains of the South. At the time, John had helped me to get a, a graduate. Uh, 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 John had helped me to go to Notre Dame. Let's, let's put it that way. And so he said, when you get to Notre Dame, uh, here's what you should study. You should study about black people in the mountains of the South. I said, excuse me? I would never waste my time like that. Uh, in fact, I was trying to get away from being identified. For, I, I told people I was from New Jersey. <laughs> they took me more seriously when I could tell them I wasn't. I mean, you tell them from Harlan County, they'll make you start looking to see if you got a tail. <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, in fact, so John convinced me, and I, I used to say, but John, I don't want to do this. Because every time I look at a representation of white people in the mountains of the South, it looks like Jethro and Granny and Ellie Mae. You remember, you remember those people? On the, anybody ever see a movie in 1972 called Deliverance? You should go see Deliverance. Deliverance. It, it was a film, Ned Beatty was his name. I mean, a fantastic, I think it won an Academy Award. But it made white people in the mountains of the South look incestuous. It made them look like snake handling, ignorant, toothless pecker woods. Did I say that? Did I say that? <laughs> Anybody know what a pecker wood is? You know what a pecker wood is? <laughs> Bruce, tell this boy what a pecker wood is. I'm just, I'm just kidding. But seriously, wasn't it, sir? That was a term applied to whites in the mountains of the South when I was a boy. In fact, they even subverted the word redneck. You might be a redneck if. You remember Jeff Foxworthy? He became a millionaire making redneck jokes. And in fact, when they were trying to organize the coal miners in Blair Mountain 100 years ago in West Virginia, 
to identify each other, the black coal miners and the white coal miners, they tied red bandanas around their necks because it was 10,000 of them. And you got to identify them because they had red scarves around their neck and they called them rednecks. Black men had them on, white men had them on. Somehow they converted that so that a redneck became somebody that had a hood on. Yeah, long story. <laughs> Banjo, they said, whites in the mountains of the south have a dysfunctional culture. Lord have mercy, Jesus, what is a dysfunctional culture? But that's what they said about white people in the mountains of the south when I was growing up. And even now, they've even transferred it, as J.D. Vance did, to say one of the reasons to explain the opioid crisis in the mountains of the South is that that's the way whites in the mountains of the South adjust to their declined economic position in the South. So they're using the same stereotypes that they used to say that lazy colored people. Just look at the stereotypes. It's the same stuff. They just want to drink. They're ornery. They're isolated. They're out of the mainstream. So the same things they said about poor black southerners, they said about poor white southerners. I used to say had there not been any black people in the South, wonder what that would have made the white people. Let that sink in. Look at the stereotypes. You might be a redneck if hee-haw, Beverly Hillbillies. White Appalachians, they say, might be the only people in America that you can still make a racial joke about and nobody gets mad. That's the way they treated our people here in the mountains of the South. So to my point, if you take a walk with me, you will find these kind of scenes in 1927, the Black Mountain Colored School up near Everts. 1927. That's where I'm talking about, the Appalachia where I was born and where my maternal grandmother and grandfather and father and their siblings, they all came from right around here in this big, big black star. That's where we were. That lady there, I, I commend you to study Effie Wallace Smith. Effie grew up on Clow Creek in Pike County, the first African American to publish in Harper's Magazine. Bruce, if you think we did something in Spirit Hollow, she was writing poetry in 1895 and then went to Kentucky State. But nobody in Kentucky knows about that brilliant woman. So she moved to Wisconsin. Our people came up out of Alabama. They came from right up around Inslee, Birmingham, Jasper, and they came up into the mountains like Mr. August Miles. Same way. That's where we ended up at. We ended up in Benham and Black Mountain and Corbin and, Com oh, Corbin. Anybody from Corbin in here? Boy, I'd like to tell you some Corbin stories. <laughs> yes, in 1919, it was 1921, they rounded up all the black people in Corbin and shipped them to Knoxville the same night, 205 of them shut them down, took all their property, ran them out of Corbin because a white lady said she had been raped. You know, a white lady said she'd been raped and probably sent more people to deaths than you can imagine. Yes, I said it. See, we have to study our history. If you don't study your history, you're subject to do it again. I saw someone on Facebook the other day. I don't like Facebook. I don't read Facebook too much. But it said, there were a group of people in 1957 who tried to keep a black girl from going to school, and now that they're 75, they're trying to keep their grandchildren annoying from knowing that they tried to keep a black girl from going to school. That's why in a lot of states, they're trying to keep people from te teaching history. That's about as communist as you can get. So that's where we're from. These are the places inside that circle. Keystone, Welch, Gary, Beckley. That's what I try to write about, all those places. Oh, you're not a pretty scene. That was Lynch in October of 1957, coming down from number five toward the tipple. It looks a little bit like that this morning uh, in October. Uh, but that place at one time, Thomas Kellerman of Benham said that Lynch could lay a claim to being the greatest coal camp in the world. Lynch had the largest coal tipple in the world uh, when I was born in 1945. Uh, uh, this man right here named Mr. Simmons owned a funeral home in Harlan. They were standing in front of the Black Mountain Corporation, and they were union officials. That's a black neighborhood in, in Letcher County in Fleming, and they, that just tells you a little bit about these people. That's some uh, uh, scenes in Lynch, uh, people getting ready to vote, uh, Hazard family. Those are some Hazard preachers. I have thousands of these. I got most of my photographs. Guess where I got them from? The Goodby is, it, is that the way you pronounce it? Appalachian. Appalachian Center 
Right here. Where, where you at, baby? Stand up. Stand up. Yeah, stand up, please. She gave me all the... Thank you so much, Iris. Yeah, Iris got us a bunch of photographs from my book. And in fact, I heard the people from CNN called you recently to get some more. Very good. Uh, black Appalachian values. Hardworking, family first, religion, schooling, neighborliness, patriotism, sense of humor, sense of humility, honesty, neighborliness. These aren't... In fact, I could take this word off of here. Those are simply Appalachian. Lord have mercy, what that thing do? <laughs> that was pretty cool. Uh, as you see, I use this mirror image of a white face and a black face. And in many instances, I'm saying black people and white people, as far as I knew in Harlan County, they had a lot of shared values. They did a lot of the same stuff. They ate the same kinds of food. Uh, and they also had a lot of the same shared experiences. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah, we, we, we're a lot ahead of ourselves. That's, a, that's uh, up in number five, as we called it, in the mountains in Lynch, a colored neighborhood. Uh, took that picture in 1980. Uh, we all know about Portal 31. Uh, those men there, many of them, Red Allman, uh, Mr. Morrow, Mr. Mule Train. Anybody remember a man named Mule Train Coleman? <laughs> yeah, Mr. Mule Train. Uh, they had 54 children between them. Uh, there's a picture again of Patsy and Ricky and Jerry, uh, uh, last of the four coal mines. And uh, uh, I was so pleased that they took this photograph and put it on the front top of the Kentucky African American Encyclopedia. That meant a lot to us. My mama played at that little church on the right there called the Rising Star Baptist Church in Benham. If you go to a lynch, it always sits up there with his head stuck up above the kudzu. Uh, and our mama played in that church for at least 40 years. Uh, black people had a lot of benevolent organizations. And then that thing right there came along. Who knows what that is? That's the front end of a continuous minor. And uh, my father was once given a job running around those. He came home and said, you know, Billy, I'm going to do really well with my new job running that big machine. But it also run 300 boys out of lynch. Because it took one continuous minor and 300 men had to go. So imagine now uh, the production of coal in East Kentucky is high as it's ever been, higher than it's ever been, but no people re required. So that what happened in Harlan County, the black population, when I tell people right now, I'm glad Harlan County is called the black bear capital of Kentucky because you're subject to see more black bears than black people. <laughs> I saw two last night up behind the Benham Inn. No black people, but I did see two bears. <laughs> I mean, you know, I used to, you know, when I went to University of Kentucky in 1966, for example, uh, I remember people saying to me, you from Harlan County? I said, yeah, ain't no black people in Harlan County. And I said, wow. In fact, Lexington was the whitest place I'd ever been in my life. I called my mom, I said, mom, number one, they let the squirrels run free around here, send my shotgun down here. <laughs> I couldn't believe you couldn't shoot them squirrels. <laughs> but the other thing that just surprised me, there were no black people in the University of Kentucky that was just like, man, I ain't got nothing against nobody. But I've never seen a place so white as the University of Kentucky. I was living in a dorm called Hagen Hall. It had 300 guys in it and me. And it was kind of like very frightening, very intimidating, uh, very nasty, the things that people did. And some of them are my age now. I saw a couple of them last week. They inducted me into a Hall of Fame at the University of Kentucky. And I stood with a guy that was 76 years old, just like me. I said, you remember how y'all used to treat me? Do you ever go tell your grandchildren what you did when you was 20 to me? I remember you. You know, because people did some horrible things in those days. Uh, and, and then going to tell you Big Blue. Huh. I digress. Uh, the black population in Harlan County has decreased by 95% in the last 30 years alone. 95%. In fact, if the outmigration of everybody in Harlan County was the same as the outmigration of blacks, it wouldn't be nobody in Harlan County. Just look at the room. Just remember, if the outmigration of West Virginia was the same way, Southwest Virginia in the same way, you can go to these places where when I was born in the mid 40s, uh, there was 4,700 black people in Lynch, Kentucky alone. 4,700. That's a lot of people. And now uh, there are probably more people in this building this morning than there are in Lynch, Kentucky. 
uh, when you talk about a decrease. That's my father. Uh, this, this thing right here kind of helped run, run him out, remember, because he, the continuous miner did this. Then he came along with something called what? Mountaintop removal. You just take the whole mountain off, and you get the coal a lot faster. So, so that, that's the, what they do. We lived in a company house. We went to a company school. We worked for a company according to company rules. We drank company water. We saw by company lights. We listened to a preacher that the company said was right because the preachers were hired by the company. If the company didn't approve of the preachers in the 50s, the preacher had to go. That's why he didn't know so-called civil rights movement in eastern Kentucky. Finally, where'd they go? They went to Ohio, they went to Atlanta, they went to Charlotte, they went to Louisville, they went to Lexington, they went to St. Louis, they went to Columbus, they went to Cincinnati, they went to Toledo, they went to a place called Ypsilanti, I'm sorry, Ypsilanti in Michigan. That's where all of our people went to. And uh, that's where they migrated to in the last 50 years. Just look at the way the, the, the numbers went down. So I ask myself sometime, if I had to write another book, I would try to write now about what is, a, what is life like right now for black people who live in eastern Kentucky? What's it like now? I wrote about what it was like when I was coming along. I wonder what it's like now. Uh, who are the role models for these young people? What's the nature of race relations? Do black and white people get together? In, see, they used to get together in the mind, didn't they, Rudd? Well, now, do they get together? Uh, thank God for higher ground. Y'all still do higher ground? Uh, so what I've done in the last 34 minutes is what I usually teach a class called Blacks in Appalachia. It takes me 16 weeks to do it, and I hope I've done it adequately in 36 minutes. I want to thank you all for inviting me, and I can't leave here without pointing to that fellow at the arrow right there. Uh, and I would say, you remember that commercial that I think was called Surly, Nobody Doesn't Like Surly or something like that? Well, I would like to say I can't think of anyone in Harlan County who didn't like my brother Irvin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of us Turners, but Irvin was the one that everybody liked. Yes, sir. Okay, once again, thank you, Southeast Community College. Thank you, Carolyn. God bless you, and thank you all very much for coming. I'm done now. Thank you.